excited that you guys are all here uh, at Enterprise Works uh, for, for this event. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Craig Blodnick um, and uh, Caitlin Shoren today. Um, Craig is a uh, University of Illinois alum. Uh, he graduated with a bachelor's in nuclear engineering and then went on to be the founder of Cleverbridge, which makes e-commerce solutions for software companies. Um, my hope is that you guys will see Craig here um, more in the future because he is really passionate about um, working with and mentoring the next generation of, of entrepreneurs. Um, he's been a vital partner for growing the entrepreneurship ecosystem here and routinely serves as a mentor to students, uh, a judge for venture challenges and an entrepreneur in residence. Uh, he's been an entrepreneur in residence at the research park. He's also a, a generous sponsor of efforts to increase uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the tech space. Um, so please join me in, in welcoming uh, Craig Bodnick. I'm also pleased to have Caitlin joining us today. Uh, Caitlin is currently the CEO of Zengins, which is an AI company um, that helps with the uh, conversion of, of data. And I think we're going to hear uh, a bit more about that today. But Caitlin also bleeds orange and blue, or the bleed purple. Which, which side of the fence? The All right, there you go. Yeah, that, that's a, that's the correct answer for this audience. Um, and you know, she got her bachelor's degree in electrical engineering uh, and then an MBA from the Kellogg School of Business. Um, and has had a, a, a long career as a, in, in consulting before becoming CEO of Zengen. So join me in welcoming Caitlin. So I think um, what most entrepreneurs and our founders here are usually interested in um, from you know, more experienced entrepreneurs like yourselves is, is to hear a little bit more about why start a company how did you get involved in, in entrepreneurship? Uh, Craig, you uh, have a bachelor's in nuclear engineering uh, and then took your experience uh, working in, uh, in, in the industry that you ended up founding your company in. Can you talk a little bit about what got you interested in starting the company? Well, I, I always love to say that uh, I had no intention of being an entrepreneur. And back when I was on campus in the late 80s, early 90s, there was no real discussion about entrepreneurship. It was just, I'm here to get a degree, have some fun, and then go into the work world. So for me, I started a, a little bit later in life, kind of like Caitlin will, will explain to you, that uh, you know, just didn't, didn't jump out of school and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be an entrepreneur and become one. But what I, I saw was that I was working in, an, in the e-commerce industry for a company, and that company, I, I really I loved working for this company. It was based out of Berlin, Germany. I would go and spend time uh, in Germany working with my colleagues. I knew German from high school, and here at the university I had taken classes. So I was just really having a great time working for this, this e-commerce company. I loved the subject matter. It was just really, really fun. It was almost like, um, the, the old adage, if you find a job you love, you don't you don't work. But what is it? Something like you'll never you'll work. You'll never, never work a day in your life because you just love what you do, and, and that was me. But the day that that company out of Germany was acquired was the the moment that I said, okay, I'm not going with this company. I'm not going to continue because the company that acquired the one I worked for out of Germany, I had worked for previously, and I didn't want to work for them again. I knew them, I didn't like their culture, I didn't like the, the philosophy and the vision that they had. So I said, I'm out of here. That same day, I went and called one of my friends in Germany when the announcement was made that we were acquired, and I said, Martin, we should go off and do something ourselves. We love working with each other, we, we have a really good team of people that we, we also enjoy working with. We've got connections in the space, we've got some capital from the sale. Let's go off and do something ourselves. And that's basically what we ended up doing. So my journey was really, it was a bit of a, a big bang where it's like, whoa, there's an opportunity. I can either try and take the opportunity or 
let it pass by and just continue on the path I was on. And so for me, that was, that was a moment that I, I actually called getting into entrepreneurship at that time blissful ignorance. I didn't have any idea what I was getting into. It was just, hey, let's go start a company. Let's just go, let's go do something together. And 15 years later, it worked out, and, and there were lots of uh, tears and sweat and a lot of a lot of tears along the way. So, yeah. yeah. So, Caitlin, uh, you uh, recently, uh, within the last three years, I think, I think you said, uh, joined the founding team of, of Zengins. Can you talk about uh, the decision to? Uh, become a part of this particular company and uh, your transition into leading the company as CEO. Um, so first, I want to tell everyone that I am crashing in this fireside chat. So if you keep hoping, Larry, this is how you get strong on your ways to the, the stage. But also, I want to affirm the comment about what an amazing resource and mentor and uh, supporter of entrepreneurship Craig is, because I'm here Honestly, he brought me into the investment community. He has encouraged me along my entrepreneurship journey. He has introduced me to this amazing network to allow me to be where I am today. So really, he is an amazing resource to all of you, and you should capitalize on that. Absolutely. Uh, so similar to what Craig said, I always tell people that I feel I have an unexpected founder. <coughs> I am first generation, and I didn't think about starting a company. I saw what my parents did, which was work in a factory their whole lives, and work, work was important because you provided, right? And having that security was priority number one. And so for me, it was get a good degree, work really hard, find a good stable job. So that was the path I was on, and it was these very unexpected moments of meeting someone, hearing a conversation, and just gravitating towards that opportunity that allowed me to be here. So the first one was out of undergrad. I actually did spend a couple of summers being a technical engineer, so I was building circuits for Motorola. And I was somewhat enjoying it because I was applying my electrical engineering degree, but I sensed that I didn't want to be in the same cube every single day of my life. So upon graduation, I met one or one of my best friends from college. She had encouraged me to explore consulting because she said it's a great place to be in different projects and learn a lot. You have to solve a lot of difficult problems, so you should give it a shot. And that's why I went from being a everyday building circuits engineer to being a consultant. And again, in consulting, I didn't think about being starting a company, I thought it would be very cool to be in a company and build something. But I liked consulting a lot because I was always solving problems. And you really solve business problems, which I think has behooved me significantly in my current role. And it was in consulting that I ran into a individual, his name is Carl Drisco. He is a serial entrepreneur, so he started sold five of his companies before. And he and I worked very closely together on projects. And it was during the late nights, uh, trying to get some client deliverables out, that he said, one day you should think about joining a startup or being in a startup because it is an amazing experience. So it was that um, amazing opportunity to have had that conversation, someone to encourage something. Carl retired for the upteenth time three summers ago, and he started playing around with AI. And he said, hey, I think I've got something pretty interesting thing, interesting here. He called me and he called two of his other former colleagues who had never met actually and said, let's, let's grow something. So he was, I would say, the, the ringleader of getting it started, but he's not a natural, outwardly uh, extroverted individual. So he doesn't like managing resources, he likes solving technical problems. And so as we were looking to grow and he said, who might be a good individual to be the face of the company, to lead the company in, in different ways? Um, I was volunteering, <laughs> but I also felt it was an amazing opportunity, just given the client-facing experience, the business experience, etc. So that was how I got to be founder. I was first in the role of customer success, and then it was led to CEO. Yeah, awesome. So um, we just heard a bit about how your 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 founding teams kind of came together, and I think that's something that is is interesting, right? For uh, for the founders and entrepreneurs here, because 
th th there are some unique challenges that come from um, ensuring that the founding team is diverse enough, right, in terms of the, the skills and capabilities that are represented. So uh, it sounds to me, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about, about this, both of you, it sounds to me like that was the case with, with your founding teams. But then beyond that, um, you know, deciding uh, who gets to lead the company as CEO, I think taking us behind the scenes a little bit and helping us understand how those decisions are made um, would, would, would be interesting. And then part of that equation is always compensation, you know, specifically equity. You know, how, how do you decide how to split equity in a way that is everyone looks at and thinks is fair? So uh, I'll, I'll go to you first, Craig, and then maybe Caitlin, you can answer the same question. So there's a couple of uh, points in there that I want to talk about. First one is how do you how do you, how did I look at the founding team? And honestly, in the in when, in the moment that we were doing this, it started with me and a very technical friend of mine in Germany, and I said we should do something together. And then uh, another one of my friends in Germany came into the office that next day, I think after the news. And I was like, he's really good because he's got a business sense about him. He's running corporate development. So it was, you had a CTO type, you had a, a product business development person. And when I say business development, I call it more like corporate development, sort of strategic partnerships and things like that. And then me, I was in the US, I had some sales experience, I had some marketing experience. I, I was more of a jack of all trades. We, the three of us discussed what do we what else do we need as part of the founding team and the thing that we felt would be would help us be most successful as would in a, in a single edition is a very focused salesperson somebody who is very experienced knowledgeable connected in our industry and we had somebody again from our German office that that was the right sort of level and experience and everything so we brought him in now that's the team from a, a, call it almost like a fill, filling in the boxes of different departments that these people could, could sort of manage. With hindsight, I would say we got lucky. Because one of the things that I realized later on that what we were fortunate we, we, and that I would look for in the future is we were all very aligned in how we viewed uh, spending money or investing in the company. Although we had different backgrounds, Germans, which are very conservative, uh, don't spend money unless you have it in the bank kind of view. American, myself, who's, hey, let's just go borrow two million dollars and you know we can finance it and that sort of stuff. I mean, that isn't really who I am. So that's why I fit better with their mentality. So all of us had a very similar viewpoint of saying, okay, let's be conservative with our, our money. Let's, let's not pay ourselves for two and a half years. Right, let's find some government grants in Germany. That was really important because it prevented us from having disagreements about how to grow the business as things were developing. So, so that, that's that one part of the founding team. Then the CEO part of it, so it was the three of us, myself, our CTO, our future CTO, and then my other partner um, who was part of the, the, the founding three of us, we had the conversation, I remember it to this day. We had the conversation and it was, okay guys, we have to decide who's gonna be CEO. And so the technical one, he's like, well, I'm gonna be CTO, so it's not me. So it's, it's down to you two. And I just said, I don't wanna be CEO. Christian, you should do this. And he's like, yeah, let's do that. And that was it. Like it, it fell into place because I didn't want to be CEO, honestly. And, you know, to what you said about like the founder, I didn't really want to be the focal point. I didn't want to be out in front of people. I just wanted to build stuff and, and go do things. Later on, I became the CEO, and I think I I did an okay job at it. But I, I felt confident enough after doing a regular job in the company, being just an executive for ten years, to go, okay, yeah, I'm willing to do this. I, I think I can do this. It's it's. It's something I can imagine. Yeah. Is there another part of the question? Yeah, so... so oh, you know, the equity. The equity. Right. Person, right. So then the third part, on equity, we had this conversation too. And uh, I'd say we were a little bit fortunate because, again, Germans, love them, 
hope there's some in here. If there's not, we can talk about that for later. <laughs> but uh, the important part is that when we decided to do the equity, we did it like an engineer. We said, okay, what are the parts of the value that we each bring to the table? So the first column, we've got a spreadsheet out, and we got a, a column, we put everybody's name next to it. And then we said, okay, first column, what is the job that we're doing? What do we think the value of that roughly in a reasonable way is in the market? Executive, head of development, you know, program, or whatever it is. And we, would, we put a value in for that. Then we have the second column, which is how much cash are you putting in? And everybody had their different commitment levels that they were putting in. So we had that. And I think we even had a third column of, I don't remember what, and then we just did a big math equation, added it all up, divided by for each person how much they were, how much value they were contributing to the company, and that's how we split up our equity. We didn't have venture capitalists involved; it was just the founding team, basically, of kind of seven of us: four, four executives and three um, and three developers that joined us as co-founders. So that's how we we split everything up. And the downside of that is it was a very ugly cap table in terms of the numbers. It's not nice and clean and ends in zero or five or anything like that. It was 12.2876 percent. It's like pi times two plus four eight. You know, it was just kind of ugly in that way. But at the end of the day, that was the fairest way that we figured out to split up equity because we were all putting in different amounts and we were putting and we were contributing differently to the success of the company. So that's how we figured out to do it. I'd, I'd love to hear Caitlin's answer because this is going to be different. Actually, I have a quick question oh. for you, Craig. So when was the first employee after the co-founding team? So when was our first employee after the co-founding team? So we, so there was the four executives. So we all agreed we were going to do this. And then we said, OK, we need a development team. And we've got people that worked at the previous company who know this business and understand the, the inner workings of it. Let's go get them, too. So we brought in three co-founders from three, three developers that we called co-founders, not founders, but co-founders, just to have a slight differentiation there. So we had seven, and at the same time, we said we need some other knowledge to bring into the company because technology had changed since these guys were all developing the same way for five years. So we brought in two other people. They were the first true non people that we had not worked with before that we brought in as part of this broader nine-person starting lineup, if that helps. Uh, Gerald, like you, I'm always interested in some of these other founding stories and how they grew and when they grew and what happened to the cap table as they were growing to. So um, in our situation, certain points similar to what Craig was sharing, which was Carl was our technical group. Uh, and he's he, truly a savant, he solved the most amazingly difficult technical problems out there. So he was original CEO, CTO, but as mentioned, he knew he did not want to be CEO. Then we had Todd. Todd was a very um, close friend and colleague of Carl previously, and Todd was coming off of his startup. So he was CEO and chairman of the board for a company that he did for 20 plus years. And his contribution to the equation here was that he had this phenomenal network, network of angel investors that had invested in his prior company, and therefore some of them were very happy to bankroll because his company was going through PE liquidity events. And then we had Mike, who came in with uh, marketing and other operational expertise. And then when I came in, I had a I had done this problem, so the problem that Zengins is solving their own data conversion, I had worked through it, I had seen it in a variety of different ways because of consulting, and so I at that time said I would focus on the customer side, so what do we need to do from a sales perspective, what do we need to do to ensure that our product is successful? And when we started thinking about the CEO decision, um, Todd said, it could be me, but I don't know if I want it again. I just came off 25 years of, of rule, and um, I feel very lucky that Todd saw something special in me because Carl would have defaulted to Todd as a first pass of the CEO, right? Carl said, Todd and then Kate to probably later in the future. Um, but Todd said, I think I see something in Caitlin that's very special. And he said, it's her time. 
and this was behind the scenes, I wasn't there. So what was amazing is that you have people who really sponsor others, right, who see the potential and say, you need to challenge them, you need to put them on that platform and give them a shot. And then the other aspect that was important in the decision of the, the right CEO, especially at the stage of a startup, was we said we wanted to make sure that the CEO was someone who could be in the market. So it wasn't someone who is running a big company and leading it to make sure that the company is staying operational and afloat and financially secure, but we needed someone who had that uh, experience to speak to the market and say, I've got a product, you don't know what you're missing until you see my product, and speak to that with confidence. So that was part of the whole decision making around, um, around moving to that CEO position. In terms of the cap table, very somewhat similar in the sense that it was a, okay, who is doing this, who is doing that, and um, a, a certain spreadsheet that came out of it. Todd being running a company and going through this experience of cap, cap table allocations and whatnot, he basically managed the process and we had a shot to looking at what he proposed and it felt very fair and that was how it, that was how it evolved. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you know, when Craig's case really engineering it um, and, and basically having the a group of founders who knew each other really well coming together and then making the decision. And in your case, having having a um, uh, someone that you you all knew really well that you all had a lot of confidence in leading that putting putting the original founding team together and then and then ultimately proposing the, the equity allocation. That's really interesting. Um, so. We've got, a, we've got a room full of, full of uh, founders and you know, one of the things that as founders we're all thinking about is how to, how to finance our businesses. And, and in, in addition to uh, being CEOs and founders yourselves, you both uh, made investments as, as, as angel investors. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on um, what doesn't work when a founder shows up at that angel meeting, right? And you look at their pitch and you decide you're not going to invest. What is it that causes you to pass on the company? Okay. Happy to go first. Uh, it's a great question. It's really hard. No, so the first thing is that any angel investor or venture capitalist that thinks they know what the outcome will be is lying to you. They have no idea. The data will prove that nobody knows. If they knew, they wouldn't have any failures. And it's because companies go through so many different variations and problems and potholes and stuff. You just don't know what's gonna, what's really gonna work in the market and what isn't. But. Uh, there are some things that I think trigger angel investors particularly, which I would define as sort of the first professional investor into a company. Um, there's something that, there's some things that angel investors will, that turn me off, I would say. So I'll, I'll talk about it that way. The first one, and I think the biggest one, is really people who fall in, in love with their solution and don't fall in love and be obsessed about the problem that they're trying to solve. What I mean by that um, is when you see, when, when the first thing you want to do is say, let me show you a demo of what my product can do, let me show you my app, without being able to articulate verbally what is the problem you're trying to solve? What is so important that you in, intuitively and in, in your bones want to go and find a solution for? If you are more focused on the solution, like, hey, look at this cool app, look at this cool technology, that's a big red flag for me initially. Because what ends up happening is you fall in love with your solution and you say, I, can, I, I had this uh, time 25 years ago when I was working for a company and a new VP came into the business and I was really close to my client. I was sitting at UBS. I was in their IT security department and I was, a, I was a contractor, and the, the head of the department was sitting right there, and I was friends with him. I'd become friends with him. New VP of the company I worked for came into the 
came into our, our business and I was like, Craig, we need to get a meeting with him. We're trying to sell more of this thing, this platform, whatever. So he flies in, we go and have a meeting with my, my client's boss and the three of us are sitting there and, and so there was some conversation that happened. VP, my VP from, from the company I work for left. The guy at UBS turns to me and he's like, well, there's somebody that has a solution to a problem that I don't have. Like he didn't even want to listen to what my problem was. He was so anxious to sell me a solution in search of a problem. And that's just like a big problem. Another great phrase that I'll give you on this is uh, one of my employees at Cleverbridge a few years ago, we were doing some lean canvas work trying to innovate, which is another story for another time. And we were going through through the lean canvas and we were talking about something and he's like, Craig, people don't care about your solution. They care, do you have, can you solve their problem? And it always stuck with me because I never really thought about it that way, but I just think that that's a really powerful way of understanding how to put the cart before the horse. Focus on the problem, become, as Jeff Bezos says, you know, customer obsessed. In this case, I'm saying be problem obsessed. If you're trying to solve a problem for somebody, understand that problem better than anybody else. And then continue to watch if that problem changes over time because then your solution needs to change. So that's my, my number one, and I'll pause and turn it over to Caitlin on her. I would say so, it's very, very similar. And it's because I had to go through fundraising, by the way, so Craig was bootstrapped, which is amazing for his success. Uh, we are VC backed, and I went through the gauntlet of shopping the pitch deck, right, over and over and over and over again. And I think this is what's hard about it, which is, you know, our story is a bit like bait. You cast it, into the lake, and you don't know what fish might find it attractive, right? There's something that, that, that they might like, but it's the same bait, it's just something resonates with someone else. So in that regards, I think you need to make sure you stay true to what it is that you set up to solve exactly what Craig's saying. I think the other aspect, because of being in consulting for so many years, is with that problem, you need to make sure that you understand what's the outcome that the buyer really looks to have, right? So you might have, you might solve something, but then what does that do for that person? And making sure that that's part of the talk track to saying, I know that this is important because here's the problem, here's the value, and this is this is why we help and why someone will definitely want to help this product. That's great. So, um, you know, one of the things um, that we, we, you know, they say imitation is the best form of flattery, right? Um, you know, increasingly I'm, I'm seeing uh, pitches take a certain kind of style, right? Um, and it's, you know, someone gets up there and they say, this is Jane. Jane has this problem, right? And, and that comes from trying to uh, empathize with the user who has a very specific problem. Or, you know, would you rather see someone come in and take a really fresh approach to pitching? I would say no is not a turn off. As long as they really can nail what Jane, what her problem is. Right? It's, and that's the whole thing. The, this whole tech stars, you know, Jane, this is Jane, she has a problem. Well, like there's nothing wrong with that on the surface, but when the underlying foundation is still not there, that the entrepreneur doesn't understand the problem well enough, can't articulate it, that's when it becomes an issue. But I, I agree with also what you're saying. When someone comes in, when they do a really good job of thinking about how is the best way to grab the attention of the investor or the person they're talking to in a creative way, maybe illustrating the problem in a, in a really creative way, that's gonna get a lot of attention because you're gonna go, whoa, wait, this isn't the normal Jane is doing this, Bob is doing that kind of thing. So I really would love to see those kinds of presentations but that takes a lot of time and a lot of thought and creativity. But that's how you can stand out. Right. So it's a, it's a, you know, and I will also say everything we're talking about here is like shades of gray, right? There is no right answer. There's no wrong answer. It's just interpretation. And what I might like is something different than Caitlin, for example. So you, you never know, like, what the right way to pitch is. It, it, did you find? 
changing your pitch helped, or did you try changing? Uh, what we did was we we wanted to understand before we went in. We would study the VC, mm -hmm. and is there a specific um, strategy that they're investing in or whatnot? So we wanted to make sure we were always emphasizing certain points. But we try to stay true to the story. Yeah. And I think when you talk about the Jane does this, right? The most amazing part of that that I would applaud and have everyone think about is the capability of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is so important as an effective way of communicating, no matter what it is. It's a pitch deck, it's you talking to your team, it's you explaining why something got messed up, right? It's so important to be able to understand, okay, well, what was the start? Why was there a start? What happened? And then where are we going on this? And so what I like about that is it's teaching someone to convey something that might be difficult, especially something that your audience might not know anything about the problem that you're talking about. So whether it's that or whether it's a different way of explaining it, and usually what I would do is I talk about it as a, either a use case or a case study of something that a client went through. So that's a, another approach. Yeah, that's excellent. So um, um, before we, we open this up for, for Q&A, uh, as, as someone who's recently been, been raising capital and both of you having seen a, a, a lot of uh, deals, um, and, and for, for, for most of us, you know, the first, as you said, Craig, the first professional investment, you know, we get into our companies come from, from an angel investor. Uh, I want to talk about how you view a deal, right, from, from, from an angel investment perspective. Um, you know, because when when you and, and Craig, you 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 have the experience of doing you know Hyde Park Angels and now Illini Angels that 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 invest at, at slightly different stages, I would say. Um, but then you know that there's going to be multiple rounds of funding. Um, how do you think about your your check size in relation to staying in in, in a deal? Protecting your pariah, if that's important. Um, knowing that this thing is going to take, you know, a, a lot of different turns, right? And so, and then from the perspective, and maybe Caitlin, you could you could answer this of, of actually pitching. How does understanding the psychology of, of how an investor might be thinking about a deal helps with how you ultimately then pitch it? So when I, I first uh, joined Hyde Park Angels in about 2012, 2013. It was like I went to the first meeting. There were three companies presenting. Every time they, they presented and talked about their business, I was like, oh, I can see how that could work. That's, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I'll invest in that. Next one, oh, yeah, I see how that could work. That's pretty cool. Oh, let's invest in that. Third one, same thing. So I invested in all three of those. And then I you know, kept investing in other ones, and I had no idea what I was doing. Zero. I was just like, oh yeah, here's 10,000, here's 5, 10, 20, whatever. I, I had no idea. And very quickly I realized, oh yeah, there's ultimately going to be more rounds of capital that are required, so I have to put more money in. And then um, the best thing that happened, and again, at my education as an angel investor is that at Hyde Park Angels, we worked, we partnered with um, a guy named David Rose out of New York Angels. And he had written a book called Angel Investing. And I read the book, and I was like, okay, i got to stop doing everything I'm doing and start right, just focusing on a portfolio and not thinking that I'm going to pick the winner and that company will pick the winner. I have to be much more, I have to challenge much more what I'm hearing and, and really um, look at my portfolio as a whole to also decide how I'm going to invest. Because in the book, one of the things that they talk about is you need to have a certain number of companies in your portfolio. And if you have too few, you risk not getting the right returns. If you have too many, you risk having the wrong returns. If you invest too much, too early, or too, or you don't follow on for, for when companies are doing well, your whole return portfolio potential really changes dramatically. So from that perspective, I've now gone to much less of Hey, let me really understand this business and, and what's going on to more like, okay, I have I want to listen, I want to look at, at what's happening. I'm looking at the founding team. I think about sort of the, mar the macro market, what they're in, where they're going, the progress they've made. 
And then I look at it and say, okay, based on their valuation and based on the assumption that we're investing, then I'm only going to invest this amount because that's how the portfolio theory says to invest in it. So I've taken a much more uh, methodical approach without feeling for it. And one of the things I'll say is I missed the best investments through Hyde Park Angels because I looked at the company after that initial run of just investing in everything. I looked at the company and I was like, I don't understand that thing at all, so I'm just, I'm, I'm out. And those were the companies that turned out to be really good because I thought, I know e-commerce. So I'm gonna and only invest in the e-commerce companies and that was also a, a mistake. So learned a lot of lessons uh, and yeah, it's quite entertaining, I can tell you that. Yeah. Uh, as it relates to investment strategy, I would say ditto. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also because Craig talking a lot of that. Um, as it relates to your second question around now being an investor, an angel investor in these different new startups, I absolutely think that it's been valuable to how that I approached going out to fundraise. Because I just knew now what were things that either made my ear perk or had me questioning certain things. So I wanted to make sure that I was thoughtful of being in their position and making sure my pitch included certain things that were important. By the way, one thing that um, wouldn't think would be so important, but it's so important, it is that when they invest, even at angel stage, I'd say different if it's a friends and family angel investor, but even a uh, financially motivated angel investor, they're, talk, they're thinking about the long term. And so even though I just finished my, my financing at the end of last year, I'm already talking about fundraising. Right? And what I mean by this is I had to make sure that in my story, even though I'm focusing on this round and this check, I had to say, because this is going to take me to this moment in time in 18 months, and in 18 months, it's because you're going to see these results, and in 18 months, I'm going to ask for this size check, right? And they're going to be excited about that because that means that's a potential, if they want to, I have a partial exit, and they could now back into their financial books and say, okay, well, if we potentially could get this from Zengins in 18 months, and that means I could do this to my cash flow, and therefore I can have this return to my investors, it's this whole mindset of just thinking many steps ahead, but it's because it's many shit, you know, many spreadsheets or many files back. So that in that regards, being an investor, right, I had that perspective of making sure that that's part of the story. I don't make that the highlight of the story, but I'm ready to answer those questions mm -hmm. if someone wants to go there. Yeah. That's awesome. What was the name of the book again, Craig? Sounds like we should all read that, right? And just think about how we um, how we're pitching. There should be a couple copies here. Okay. A, there's a couple chapters that are really good about the portfolio theory, but right. the book itself is is quite good. Angel Investing by David Rose. Got it. All right. Excellent. Well, I think uh, we should open it up for questions now. Um, does anybody have any question for Caitlin or Craig? Sure. Both previously worked for more traditional corporate settings. Uh, how transition to the startup world, you felt that that was beneficial and how that maybe was presented some challenges to adapting to a maybe a more fast-paced environment? I felt that there was an amazing opportunity and I jumped. And when I did, now being in this position, having been in corporate, co you know, corporate America, but also serving corporate America before, I know the growth challenges. I know some of the dynamics of what does it mean to really think about corporate functions in a company and what they have to do. I had exposure to marketing aspects. So all of those things, I think, makes me a faster decision maker. You have to move fast. Um, not all of your decisions will be right, but in that regards, just the having a little bit of that experience allowed me to say, OK, well, this is my gut, and uh, my gut is well, somewhat informed of my experience, and therefore I can feel a little bit more confident in going faster than the decision. So that's part one. Um, the transition. So I had to answer this question yesterday because I spent a long time in consulting. And there is a understandably um, stereotype that consultants don't make good entrepreneurs. And I'll share with you why. Uh, I, I boiled it down to two key major differences. One is how we go to sales, and one is how we work. When we go to sales, if you think about it, any Consultants or former consultants here? Okay, so in consulting, oh, okay. So you set out to solve a problem, and of course, you want to make sure that that problem is helpful to the client, and etc. the outcome-based right, thinking. But in consulting, 
the bigger the scope, the more delighted you are, because one, obviously it's a bigger deal, right, from a revenue perspective, but more importantly, it's because when you get a one exam question from your client or potential client, you don't know if what you do for that one exam question is going to be right in context of every, the whole the whole chapter or lesson that you learned, right? And what I mean by this is sometimes I will go in with a project and they say, hey, Caitlin, just solve this, right? Um, just, just build this one thing. And you say, okay, but if I build this one thing, what does it mean for every other piece around it? Because if this one thing works, but then it breaks five other things, then you're probably going to be really unhappy with me. So in consulting, the scope, you really want to have a broader view of the scope. In, in software, especially in my company, oh my goodness, you want that repeatability. So you want that focus to be as ring fenced as possible. So that was one big difference that I'd say was a, a big transition. And making sure that you stay narrow and focused in that scope, that one problem that, that Craig was talking about, that's life or death for, for startups. So that was one big difference. And the other was how we work. And what I mean by this is being an engineer, but also being a consultant and now being a startup. Engineers, man, we love to get really faster feature function, right? It's because that is your roadmap and direction to what am I building and give me something to build because I like to build and what engineers do. So you want your business counterpart or your um, your leadership team to say, this is what the product's going to do, this is therefore what it translates into a feature function and not have your developers go off and build that feature function. In other words, this page needs to be able to download this. This data set needs to talk to this and compute this, right? So they want to get into something where finite definitions and requirements can be executed quickly. But the problem with that sometimes is you've done this and you don't step back to say, okay, well, when I test this, sure, my test data works perfectly for the code I've just developed, but have you thought about the problem? Have you thought about how someone would use that? Have you thought about what this does? If thinking about it breaking is not just a technical breaking issue. So the hard thing sometimes now with some of engineers and people who are starting in just the startup is they're very narrowly focused in that and they need to step back and remember what was the problem and what's the outcome because sometimes the engineer might actually have built it just a little bit differently by about the outcome. So it's actually, a, I'd say, an interesting dynamic because you don't want to sell too big, which is what consultants will gravitate towards doing, but you don't want to build too small, right? And you need to stay focused. So focus is very important, but what I mean by build too small is don't just look at exactly that one requirement. You should make sure you really understand what does that requirement fit in into the problem and then the outcome for the user. And, and that's why I wanted to hire Kayla a couple <laughs> years ago. And she turned me down and started this business. But um, yeah, so I think for me, working in, in the workforce first, allowed me to understand a problem and an industry that was then easy to say when the opportunity presented itself, oh, there's some there's an opportunity to do something new. There's an opportunity to innovate on what I already knew very well. So that's how working was beneficial for me. And I would actually, as she was talking, I was thinking a little bit about the analogy here where a lot of times um, in, in research, at any university, right? You're doing the same thing, just not a corporate environment, but you're becoming an expert in something, some sort of area where you know you're learning about something, you're innovating, you're kind of trying to figure out how to make it a little bit better or different. And so a lot of the experience I had in the workforce is similar to what you're having by going through and doing a master's degree, a PhD, and doing that research, because then you're getting you're getting a different skill set, but you're you're it, you're learning about a problem in industry, something, and that is effectively the same thing that I did in the workforce. Yeah. Okay. Um, I basically I started to invest in startups, so I'm a small fund in South America. I'm originally from Brazil. Um, the question is related to the the problem solving, and you guys talking a lot about problem focus and problem and it's I, I understand that it's exactly like that. But we have other point that is when you are focusing on problem uh, and you are developing uh, a solution, you you say and I would love to know from your thoughts uh, to understand your thoughts related uh, being an investor and being an entrepreneur. Okay. 
So like, how do you organize the short and long term? Because when you are focusing in, in problem, sometimes you are pursuing something that will be great in not in the short term, so you don't have a lot of revenue. And then you have like a, a two options. You can ask money and say, oh, I get a lot of revenue, I made a lot of revenue, but I'm not solving the problem and I'm not building the next step. I'm stuck in this position, but there's a lot of revenue. Or in the other side, oh, I've been doing a lot of evolution, no? and um, uh, I'm putting efforts and advancing and moving forward. I didn't make a lot of money, but I'm building a completely new and cutting edge solution. Of course, in health uh, and bio, it's more common, but in other areas, like in agriculture, where I'm, I'm uh, working, uh, it's, it's not so easy to understand those differences. So I would love to know your, your thoughts about it. Um, it's a hard problem. It really is. I'm living it right now. So with my company, so it is an AI-based company that's building a software platform to convert data. We are selling to enterprises. So B2B SaaS, in case anyone's starting to become more familiar with some of the, the way that I would pitch it. B2B SaaS is a hot, uh, very hot investment, but it is also a painful one because selling to enterprises is really painful. It's a long sales cycle. And to your point, that long sales cycle means it's a long time before I show revenue, and therefore I'm worried. Right? I'm, I'm my cash burn. How do you make sure that you're worried about cash burn, getting to a proof point, etc.? Two with two things. I think that one, it, you really should be putting pressure on yourself and your team. And I have a challenge with this. I have to say, right? It's three years in, and we actually just had a very serious uh, powwow internally to get to this. We really had to step back and say we can't just build for the sake of theoretical greatness. We really believe what we're doing is amazing and game changing, by the way. In fact, I even trademarked this legally <laughs> um, to say it's an entirely new way of converting data because I'm, I'm all in. But you can't, you can't wait for that. So what we're forcing ourselves to do right now as a product and engineering team is we look at this and say, what can you live with? Right? What is that minimum product that I can put out there and have someone test it and I might have to lower my price point because even when it's great, I think it's going to sell really with a high price point. But right now, if I shrink it down, and I might not need to lower the price point, by the way, but if I shrink it down, what can I live with? So we just brought in this amazing um, head of user experience and product. Like when the contact that Greg was talking about, the value of value. I have to tell you, my mistake here was I waited too long to bring this type of person in. He is amazing because he's trying to get us to answer that question well. Internally, we didn't do a good job of this because we had our business folks who say, customers are demanding it. They won't buy it unless you give them greatness. And then our engineering team says, I'll never finish this. Your specs are way too big, right? And so it was this huge conflict, cash burn, and, um, and now we have someone who is articulating to us, I think it was excellent. I'm gonna try to get this diagram to have all of you see it because it's a good way to answer how do you get to MVP, that minimum, everyone says viable, I call it minimal valuable product. Right, something that someone's worth going to pay for. It's this fantastic diagram illustra illustration to help you think about it better. He says, you need to make sure that you are really in the right context of your requirements to the market need. So what is that problem? And make sure you answer it. And then you have to make sure that you can say that it won't be comfortable. So what is that least product that won't be comfortable? Because comfort is when you start enriching and enhancing, but you only know comfortable once you have users in. So don't try to assume what that level of additional feature function, that additional greatness is, until you have that minimum, thin, right product, and then you start testing it, uh, that's what. So that's part one of how to do it internally. The second thing that we had to do in the meanwhile is we put services around our product. And that gave us revenue, and that's a lifeline to cash, right, in the meanwhile. In other words, we build a product, so our product has five components. It's an end-to-end -end product. We're not all done. All done will be that great product, right? But we've got enough products, we've got probably three or five products uh, components really well in a good shape. The other two are bare bones, but we'll want to evolve it. And with the three pieces, that's good enough for our team to be able to go out and sell it and say, let me understand your problem. What's your outcome that you require out of that? Our team will cover for the outcome, if you see what I mean, right? So we cover for the outcome, we use our product to test everything in between, 
break certain things in our product to actually get more learning and training back to our product. So that's how, in reality, that's been how we've had to live through that. And last thing from an investor perspective is you have to find that investment team. I guess, you know, this, this part I think is very true. You've got the big VCs, the big PE companies with an amazing brand name, and they're amazing because, yes, they can give you an amazing amount of capital, if that's the terms you get. But you have to really trust your gut that you have a good partner. And that is so important because that partner will understand your journey. Right? And that's the difference. So there are some that say, okay, I need this, but it's because I'm expecting you to deliver this, and I'm one of the investment opportunities I create and I know about. Their VC is a very well-known VC, but they are just haranguing the team every single day. Where's your sales? Where's your sales? Where's your sales? It's not a lot of value. Not at all, right? And I will, I will contrast that with someone who says, I know what enterprise sales is long. I knew that you might need a bridge, you know, that kind of conversation. You need that person to be in your corner, and that's just you vetting that relationship, right? So sometimes just be aware of um, be aware of the term sheet, right? And, and the, it's great because for potential longer term, but if you don't live past Series A, then what good was it? Sorry, nothing to add, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to have you come up and, and ask your questions. We are out of time, unfortunately, now, but why don't you join me in, in thanking uh, Craig and Caitlin.